This video is about Cauchy Euler differential equations. I will tell you how to recognize a Cauchy Euler differential equation. Then we will discuss how to solve a second order Cauchy Euler differential equation. And then how to find the fundamental set of the solutions for a, or find a fundamental set of solutions for a higher order um, Cauchy Euler differential equation. Um, so here's the, the general form. If you've got a linear differential equation and it looks like this, so some constant times x to the n times the nth derivative of your dependent variable with your respect to your independent variable, which I'm choosing um, to be x for right now, plus a different constant times x to the one less power times the next lower derivative, next lower order derivative, and then another constant times x to the one less power times the next lower order derivative. And you just keep going. So eventually you'll have a sub two times x squared times the second derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub one times x times the first derivative plus a sub zero times y equals zero. If a differential equation can be written in this form, then it is a Cauchy Euler um, differential equation. What I want you to notice here is that the power of x and the order of the derivative match on every term. So we've got the nth power of x and the nth derivative. You've got the n minus one power of x and the n minus one derivative. Over here, you've got an x squared and a second derivative, or an x to the first and a first derivative. Um, if that pattern holds for every term, and otherwise you just got constants, you've got constants out front in front of those um, powers of x times derivatives, then that is called a Cauchy Euler differential equation. So if the power of x and the order of the derivative match, or if we can manipulate the equation so that the power of x and the order of the derivative match, then um, the order of the derivative multiplying that um, power of x, if those match, then it is a Cauchy Euler differential equation. So let's write that down. So these are linear um, differential equations. And we're going to focus on homogeneous differential equations. at least at first. This coefficient function, um, a sub n of x, will be a constant times x to the n. And in general, a sub k of x will be a constant, we'll call it a sub k, um, times x to the k power. The order of the derivative and the power of x multiplying it match. So this is the form of the, the coefficient function. Of the kth derivative of y with respect to the independent variable. So for example, if you have three x cubed times the third derivative of y with respect to x minus two x squared times the second derivative of y with respect to x plus x times the first derivative of y with respect to x minus seven times y equals zero. This is a Cauchy Euler differential equation because I've got an x cubed times a third derivative and I've got an x squared times the second derivative and an x to the first times the first derivative. And I have x to the zero, which is just a constant, times y. Um, now you, you will 
tend to have constants out front, like this three, the negative two, the one, and the negative seven. That's what these a sub n and a sub k represent. Those are just constants. Those are just real numbers. Um, but if the differential equation has this form, then we say it's Cauchy-Euler. Now Cauchy-Euler differential equations are solved in a very similar method to the method that we used when we solved um, constant coefficient differential equations. If the differential equation was homogeneous and linear and it had constant coefficients, we let y equal e to the mx. And that turned out to be exactly what we needed so that the left-hand side would end up being a sum of constants times exponential functions. And since that every single term had exactly the same form, um, we could say for the right choice of exponential functions, those constants would equal zero. Um, and we would get the zero on the right-hand side. Um, something very similar happens here with Cauchy-Euler differential equations. If we wanna solve one of these, you are going to let um, you're going to let y equal x to the m. Now, in order to show you how to do this, I'm going to do this in general for a general second order differential equation. So let's say you've got a times x squared times y double prime plus b times x times y prime plus c times y equals zero. And we notice that it's Cauchy-Euler because the order of the derivative and the power of x multiplying it match for every single term. Um, and the right-hand side is zero, so this is homogeneous. And we're gonna say, okay, let's let y equal x to the m. Now watch what happens. When we use the power rule, the derivative of x to some power is that power times x to the one less power. We take the derivative again, you bring your constant down, then you bring your power down and multiply by x to the one less power. So if this is your differential equation, when you substitute into that general second order differential equation, this is what you get. You have ax squared times the second derivative of y with respect to x, so that's m times m minus one times x to the m minus two. And then we're adding a constant times x times y prime, which is m times x to the m minus one. And then we're adding a constant times y. So we have c times y, where y is x to the m. And that's equal to zero over here. So if this is the solution to this equation, then this equation must be satisfied um, by x to the m, or must be satisfied for, um, for m, uh, for the choices of m uh, that will work uh, here, that will cause x to the m to be a solution to the differential equation. So look what happens. You've got x squared times x to the m minus two, and that x to the m minus two came from taking the second derivative. So we brought that power down twice and we reduced it by one every time. So when we took the second derivative, we have an m minus two. When we took the first derivative, you have an m minus one. You have the zeroth derivative, you just have an m. Now, if I've got x squared and I'm multiplying it by x minus x to the m minus two, remember how that works. We just add the exponents together, right? Just as an example, if you had x cubed times x to the fifth, you've got five, five x's multiplying each other here times three more x's. So actually we've got eight of them. Or in general, if this is x to the n times x to the m, we have x to the n plus m. That's our rule from algebra. We do the same thing here. You add the exponents and that's gonna give you an x to the m. So we'll have x to the m times a times m times m minus one. And this is x to the first times x to the m minus one. When we add those exponents, we also get x to the m. So you have x to the m times b times m. And then you have x to the m times c over here. And then if you factor out x to the m from everything and distribute that a m through the parentheses, you have a m squared minus a m plus b m plus c equals zero. And remember, a and b 
and C are given constants. They're gonna be known for a particular differential equation. In this one, the constants were three, negative two, one, and negative seven. Here, since it's second order, we only have three constants, A, B, and C. So this is um, just a constant times M squared plus a constant times M plus a constant. And all of that times X to the M equals zero. Now, if we assume that X is not zero, then X to the M um, will not be zero. Now, remember when we're looking for a solution to a differential equation, we don't just want a solution for a particular value of X, we want a solution for an interval of X values. So we'd say, if I have this times this equals zero, the only way that happens is if this factor equals zero or if this factor equals zero. But if this factor equals zero, that means X equals zero all the time. And that, while that's fine, um, that's not actually the solution that we're looking for. Um, while Y equals zero does solve this differential equation, um, we are looking for linearly independent solutions that are non-zero linearly independent solutions. Um, so we're assuming that this function is um, not the zero function all the time. So assuming that that's true, then we must have am squared plus this constant times m plus this constant is equal to zero. And this is because we seek um, non-trivial solutions uh, y equals x to the m to the differential equation. Um, I don't want that one where it's just y equals zero all the time, even though, I mean, it's a homogeneous equation. I already know it has that solution. I'm looking for two linearly independent solutions that aren't zero. Now, I said that this was similar to the method for um, the method with constant coefficient homogeneous linear differential equations, because when we let y equal e to the mx and we differentiated twice and simplified, we said we ended up with a characteristic equation. The same thing happened here with Cauchy-Euler equations, but it's not as simple as with the um, constant coefficient equations because with constant coefficient equations, you could just say this is AM squared plus BM plus C is a characteristic. Here, we end up with AM squared plus A or negative A plus B times M plus C um, as the characteristic equation. But actually the principle is the same. You substitute here and you're gonna know a a and B and C. So you're gonna end up with a quadratic equation down here, a quadratic equation in M. And there are three possibilities for the forms of those solutions of that quadratic equation, just like there were with the constant coefficient differential equation. So this is actually gonna be very, very similar to what you did with constant coefficient equations. So let's look at the possible cases. Here's our first case. You'll remember this probably. If this is a quadratic function in M and I'm looking for the roots of that quadratic function, it's possible that if I were to graph that uh, quadratic function and here's the M axis, that parabola could cross the M axis twice at two distinct real roots, M1 and M2. So M1, and M2 may not be equal to each other, but they may both be real, then we immediately get two solutions, X to the M1 and X to the M2. And then the general solution for a second order differential equation is Y equals C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2. So that's C1, X to the M1 plus C2, X to the M2. That's our first case. Now the next possibility is if I've got a quadratic equation in M, so Y equals AM squared plus negative MA plus B times M plus C, it's possible that my quadratic function might just barely touch the M axis and it might touch it exactly once. So M1 and M2 might be the same real number we call that a repeated root. 
So that's case two. M1 and M2 are both the same and they're real. So I've got a repeated real root for that characteristic equation. In that case, the first solution is x to the m1. Now the second solution um, can't be x to the m2 because m2 and m1 are the same. So if this is x cubed, the second linearly independent solution can't also be x cubed. We've got to multiply by something else. Now we can prove that that something else turns out to be natural log of x using reduction of order. So we would say that y2 is u times y1 and we would differentiate twice and substitute into the differential equation and we find out what u had to be. We would end up with a linear first order differential equation in u prime, we solve for u prime, we um, anti-differentiate to get u and then we'd say that um, given certain choices of our constants, uh, u is equal to natural log of x. So I'm not going to prove this now, but you can if you want to. This can be derived using reduction of order. That's our second uh, case. Now the third possibility is that if you've got a quadratic function, it may never cross the m axis, not in the real number system. So maybe the graph looks like this, in that case, the discriminant um, corresponding to this uh, quadratic function, that b squared minus 4ac, or in our case, it'd be yeah, negative a plus b squared minus four times a times c. That number, if that number happens to be negative, if you solve that quadratic equation, this set equal to zero, you would get negative numbers under that radical um, so you would get two complex conjugate roots, but you wouldn't have any real roots. So that's the third case. So you might have complex conjugate roots, m1 and m2, equal to alpha plus or minus beta i. Now the first linearly independent solution is x to the alpha times cosine of beta times natural log of x. And the second linearly independent solution is x to the alpha times sine of beta times natural log of x. Okay, so those are our cases whenever we're dealing with a second order Cauchy-Euler differential equation like this. Okay, so now that we've solved our Cauchy-Euler, um, or now that we have assumed that y is equal to x to the m because this is a Cauchy-Euler differential equation, differentiated twice and substituted and said, I'm not looking for the zero function. Um, I want two linearly independent non-zero solutions to this um, second order differential equation. We're seeking non-trivial solutions. Um, this uh, characteristic equation must be zero. And since it's quadratic, because it was a second order differential equation, we've got three cases. You have distinct real roots. Each one corresponds to the solution x to the m1 um, and x to the m2. It's going to be x to the m for each um, distinct real root. And then we said, um, if you have a repeated real root, so maybe this factors to x minus or m minus k cubed, or m minus k squared, excuse me, then you'd have x to the k and x to the k times natural log of x is your second linearly independent solution. And that can be derived using reduction of order. And then we said in the third case with your complex conjugates, um, the two solutions are actually x equals, or um, x or y sub one, excuse me, equals x to the alpha plus beta i, and then x equals, or y sub two equals x to the alpha minus beta i, um, but that can be rewritten using um, Euler's formula into this cosine of beta natural log of x and sine of beta natural log of x. 
because the x to the beta i can be written in this form. Um, so we're going to skip that part of the derivation, but that's what happens when you have um, a second order differential equation. Now let's just do a couple of examples and then we'll talk about higher order differential equations. So here's our first example. We have, let's see, four t squared times y double prime plus eight t times y prime plus y equals zero. And let's say we wanna solve this equation. Now the independent variable is different. It's a t instead of an x, but it's still a Cauchy-Euler equation because the power of t um, that we have here is the same as the order of the derivative that's multiplying it. So it's a t squared and that's a second derivative. That's a t to the first and that's a first derivative. And there's no t here and that's a zeroth derivative. So we're going to assume that this is our differential equation. Um, it's a Cauchy-Euler equation. So we can let y equal our independent variable t to the m power. And that's, we, we do that because the DE is Cauchy-Euler. Then we'll take the first and second derivative. So you bring your power down, multiply by T to the one less power. Then bring your power down again, multiply by T to the one less power again. And then substitute into the equation, that's 4t squared times y double prime, which is m times m minus 1 times t to the m minus 2. And then we're adding 8t times y prime, that's m times t to the m minus 1. And then we're adding y, which was t to the m. and that's equal to zero. So we computed uh, y prime and y double prime. We substitute into the differential equation. And then we simplify. And then we'll come up with the characteristic equation. So, I've got a t squared times t to the n minus two. When I multiply those together, we add the exponents. So that's gonna give me a t to the m. Then I'll distribute. I've got four m times m minus one. So that's four m squared minus four m. And then I've got this over here. This times this gives me t to the m. So I factored that out and I'm left with an eight m there. And then I've got a one over there. So this times this equals zero which means that this has to be zero. And I'll add those two middle terms together. That's your negative AM plus BM from that general formula we were looking at. Now this has to be zero because we want this to be satisfied for all values of T, not just for a particular value of T. So when T is non-zero, um, we need this to be zero. Now when T equals zero, this is also zero, um, but we want this to be satisfied even when t is not zero. So that means that this must be zero. So that's our characteristic equation. Now this one can be solved by factoring. First times first has to be 4m squared. So I'll use 2m and 2m. Last times last has to be positive one. So I'll use plus one and plus one. And now let's check first times first is 4m squared. Outer times outer is 2m. Inner times inner is also 2m, so that's 4m. Last times last is 1. So this is equal to this 2m plus 1 quantity squared. And the only way that that's 0 is if that um, base is 0. So 2m plus 1 must be 0, which means that m or 2m must be equal to negative 1. And if we divide by 2, we have m equals negative 1 half. So we've got two roots, 
m1 oops, and m2. And they're both equal to negative 1 half because that's squared. So the first solution is y equals t to the m1. And the second solution can't be y equals t to the m2 because m1 and m2 are the same. And y sub 2 has to be linearly independent from y sub 1. Well, we, we didn't prove it, but we said if we wanted to prove it, we could using reduction of order, y2 turns out to be t to this power times natural log of t. So the general solution of this second order differential equation is y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2, which is equal to c1 times t to the negative one half plus c2 times t to the negative one half times natural log of t. And that's true for all real numbers. Okay, so we've got the characteristic equation. We factor and we solve for m. And then once we have m1 and m2, we can state y1 and y2, and then we can state the general solution on some interval of existence i. So that one happened to have a repeated real root. Let's look at another one. Sorry, I'm in a room that is very, very cold right now. So I'm sometimes struggling with my words a little bit because my toes are, they're frozen. It feels like they're frozen. <laughs> let's, let's do another, another one. And this differential equation, let's do this one. Let's say we've got uh, t squared times y double prime plus t times y prime minus 4y is equal to zero. Again, we notice that it's a Cauchy-Euler equation. You've got t squared times the second derivative, t to the first times the first derivative, and no t's times the zeroth derivative. The order of the derivative and the power of t match, so this is a Cauchy-Euler equation. So we'll let y equal t to the m, then compute y prime, and compute y double prime. And then we substitute into the differential equation. We've got t squared times y double prime. Plus t times y prime. And then we're subtracting 4 times y, and y was t to the n. And that has to be zero. And we can always factor out a t to the m as provided that we've taken our derivatives correctly. And so this times this gives us a t to the m, and then what's left is an m times m minus one. If you distribute, you get m squared minus m. Over here, we'll just have an m left over and a minus four, and that equals zero. Now we want this product to be zero for every value of t, not just t equals zero. So the only way that is equal to zero for every possible real number value of t, um, this, um, this expression over here must be zero. And those turn out to reduce. And so we end up with m squared minus four, which factors to m plus two times m minus two. Oops. I said the right thing, but then I wrote down the wrong thing. So. I've got this times this equals zero. So either the first factor equals zero or the second factor equals zero. And so we get um, m1 equals a negative two and m2 equals two. So the first solution is e to, or t to the m1. So that's t to the negative two. And the second linearly independent solution is just t to the m2. Um, so since we've got these two distinct roots, we just get two um, distinct, or not distinct, two linearly independent solutions immediately, which is great. So we can state the general solution is y equals c1y1 plus c2y2. So we get c1 times t to the negative two plus c2 times t squared. Now this t to the negative two, that means there's a t in the denominator. So t can't be zero. 
Um, but t could be anything else. So the interval of existence could be zero to infinity, or it could be negative infinity to, to zero. Um, either one of those would work. And if I'm trying to decide bete between two intervals of existence, I'll choose the one that contains the um, t value, excuse me, in my initial conditions. So if you see that your initial conditions have you know, t equals five, then you would choose zero to infinity. If your initial conditions um, had t naught equals negative three, well, then you choose negative infinity to zero. Okay, so that was our um, second example, and that was for two distinct real roots. Now let's see one where we have complex conjugate roots. I guess I gave it away. <laughs> Let's see, we've got x squared times y double prime minus x times y prime plus 5y um, is equal to zero. Okay. Well then, since the power of x and the order of the derivative multiplying it are the same, that's an x squared and a second derivative, that's an x to the first and a first derivative, there's an x to the zero and the zeroth derivative, we're gonna let y equal x to the m, and we'll take the first and second derivative, just using the power rule. If you want, you could distribute that m times m minus one immediately to m squared minus m. Many students like to do that. And then you take these guys and you substitute into the differential equation because you're assuming that y equals x to the n is a solution to that differential equation. So of x squared times y double prime. Minus x times y prime. Plus five times y which was assumed to be x to the m, that's equal to zero. And you factor out an x to the m there and you're left with m squared minus m from here and a minus m from here and a plus five from there. Now we want this product to equal zero for all values of x because we don't want um, y to be the zero function and we aren't just looking for this solution of this equation at x equals zero. Um, if that's going to be satisfied for all real numbers x and we're not interested in that trivial solution x or y equals zero, um, then this equation, this polynomial equation must be zero. So we've got m squared minus 2m plus 5 and that must be zero. So we'll subtract 5 from both sides and we'll get this. And then the number in front of m, we'll call that b. I'm gonna complete the square to solve this. You could have used the quadratic formula, that would work as well. Um, but since the coefficient of m is even, it's easy enough to complete the square. So I identify b, take half of that, and then I square it. So I add one over here to complete the square and I do the same thing on the other side, just to keep everything nice and equal then because we have completed that square, that's gonna be a perfect square. So I'm saying to myself, m plus or minus what gives me this um, when I square it. I need two numbers that multiply to give me positive one that add to negative two. Negative one and negative one will work. So that's m minus one squared. And over here, we've got a negative four. And I wanna get m by itself. So I take the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus on the right. So you have that, and then when you get m by itself, you have that. So m1 and m2 are equal to one plus or minus two i. So that's alpha plus or minus beta i. So alpha equals one and beta equals two. So we've got complex conjugate roots. So our solutions are x to the alpha cosine of beta times natural log of x. And that comes from Euler's formula again. Um, 
alpha in this case is one, beta is two. So this is x times cosine of two x, or two natural log of x. And y sub two looks just like that one, but instead of a cosine, it has a sine. And then the general solution in this case is y equals c1y1 plus c2y2, which is equal to c2x cosine of 2 natural log of x plus uh, oops, c1, c2 times x sine of 2 natural log of x. And this will work for all positive numbers x. I have y, then I've got y prime, y double prime. We substitute into the differential equation. We simplify. We solve for m1 and m2. And then once you have m1 and m2, you can find y1 and y2. And then the general solution is c1y1 plus c2y2 and you want that on an interval i. Okay, so we've done examples of three uh, second order differential equations that were Cauchy-Euler differential equations. And we see that these are the forms of the solutions in those cases. Um, and we also know how to recognize a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. So we've done this and we've done this. I think I'm going to save finding a fundamental set of solutions for higher order Cauchy-Euler ODEs for the next video. I'll show you the form of the solution. If you have a root that is repeated k times or complex conjugate pairs that are repeated k times. Um, and then we will solve some higher order Cauchy-Euler differential equations.